Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. Our guest today is Fancy Vargas. Fancy, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah. Fancy, what do you like? You, you've been an entrepreneur for a while. Tell us how you take care of yourself, like, as well as you know, physically, mentally, all that kind of stuff. What do you do to take care of yourself? Um, so, both physical and mental health, I love to hike. I haven't got to hike as often as I used to, and I'm trying to reprioritize that. But that helps me clear my mind. And of course, any physical activity is good for the body. So you have any favorite hiking places? Uh, North Bend, um, but also Mount Rainier, Latches or Natchez Loop, um, which is in Mount Rainier. It's really beautiful, covered in wildflowers, takes a few hours, like four different lakes. My favorite hike. And you go like go by yourself? You have like a group of friends that go hiking with you? Sometimes I go uh, with my friends and sometimes I go with my family. And like how often do you go? Um, again, I need to go more often, but maybe like every couple of weeks. Okay. So yeah. Pretty regularly. Yeah. I'd and, like to go once a week is the ideal for me. Okay. Yeah. And it, you have any other hobbies? Uh, swimming. Okay. Yeah. I love the ocean and I, I could swim for like three hours at a time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. You've been like a lifelong swimmer, like since mm -hmm. you were a little kid. I'm pretty sure I was a mermaid in my past <laughs> life. <laughs> nice. Um, and you're a, you're a first generation immigrant. I am. So what does that mean? Always get confused. Like, does it mean like you came over from the from the country? Your parents came over. What does that mean first generation? So that first generation means that my parents were immigrants and we're the first people in our family to be born here in the okay. United States. I got it. And yeah. and what country do you come from? Um, my mom is from Panama and my dad's from Mexico. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um. You ever go back to those countries any once in a while? I have not, but we are planning to start going as a family, and I'm wanting to send my kids back once a year. I think that uh, them being so removed from um, our family's history has not done them any good, and it'd be good for them to learn perspective. Um, this is just a little too much entitlement these days with these kids. So Yeah, but I think every generation says that. If you go back to the 1600s, they'll say, <laughs> that generation will say our kids are spoiled. Right? Each, each that, generation, the other, 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 other following generation, kids are spoiled. Or like they didn't <laughs> struggle like we did. But yeah, you work so hard so they don't have to struggle like you. Yeah, and you get mad because they're not tough. They're, like yeah, you. it's kind of you know hypocritical a little bit, you know. Yeah, that's that's a valid point. Yeah. yeah, I have that conversation with my daughter, my oldest daughter, a lot, and just telling her like I'm glad you didn't have to go through the things that I've gone through, but also you need to have some gratitude which I feel often comes with perspective. Yeah. So when you have a life where you are being taken care of well, um, you don't really get that perspective outside of what you've experienced yourself. And you've been an entrepreneur like a, like a little while, like how many years? Uh, it'll be four years in yeah. September is when I'm celebrating my business anniversary. And do you think you being an entrepreneur it has an advantage of you as far as raising your kids? Like your kids get to see like the like what you do as an entrepreneur versus like working a regular nine to five job? Absolutely, because when I talk to my kids about what they aspire to be or what how they dream up their future, it's never a I'm gonna work at. It's always a well I'm gonna start this and I'm gonna do this. Actually, my son who's thirteen has already started his little entrepreneurship ways. Um, they have Chromebooks that are assigned to kids in school now, but the Chromebooks are locked so the kids can't access certain sites. Well, my son wanted to play Fortnite and he found out how to do the coding to unlock it and then started selling the codes at school. And I'm like, you know, I, yeah, I'm like, you know what? That was a really I'm, I'm good sure, idea. I'm sure the school will say it's unethical and moral. You're stealing something. I think that's, uh, that's like the hell of a hat. I'm like, son, like, that was a great plan. I mean, you shouldn't have done that because the rules are the rules for a reason. But can we learn to use your powers for good? Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like their mindset is definitely different because they've seen me um, like want to do things and create things in my mind and actually bring it to fruition. And they're like, OK, well, now I can think of cool things that other people haven't thought of and make it a reality. So what were you doing before you started your own company? Being a stay at home mother. Stay at home mother. OK. <laughs> yeah. So what made you decide, like, take this plunge to be an entrepreneur? Like what kick off that process? Um, so it actually. I always like to say when people ask me, like, how'd you start your business? Like, honestly, it started me. Uh, during the BLM movement, uh, I really noticed that my kids, my older two kids were struggling with all the messages that we're seeing in the media and the imagery. And I wanted to do something to help them navigate their feelings. So I put together 
um, a protest in Renton for families and kids. Uh, but I invited the kids out to lead the protest. So they led the chants. They shared their talents. They wrote songs about how they were feeling and about what was going on in our country, dances. Um, I created like a handmade quilt where I hand stitched a lot of the victims from police murders names on the quilt made out of a weighted blanket. Um, so it was just a really good time for us to gather in community and kind of help our children navigate this. And after that, the Arts Commission came downstairs and asked if I would put together an art walk for the city of Renton because they wanted to find a way to um, like acknowledge what was going on through art, but they wanted it to be community led. So I had no clue how to do that or how I was going to do that, but I just figured like, okay, well, if this is something that is a need, then I'll figure it out. Like I'll make it happen. So I Googled my way through the process and the city liaison, Jesse, she was great at helping me with that. Um, and the reception from the community and city council members was just really great throughout that whole process. And that's really how I got introduced to the first group of artists that I worked with. And then projects just started coming from that um, one after another. Eventually, I was introduced to our community elders, uh, an organization led by Dr. Linda Smith. She runs a nonprofit in Renton where their focus is to help with houselessness, uh, workforce equity, um, domestic violence victims, just all, all the good things doing in the community they've started. And through that process, I was asked to put together the uh, Juneteenth celebration for the city of Renton. And then, yeah, everything from there kind of grew. So it's all things that where I either saw a need um, or someone literally placed the opportunity in my lap and it just all kind of took off. So these, these are uh, things you made, like you did it by hand, sewing machine. Oh, the blank. Yes. Yeah. I made them by hand. Okay. Yeah. How long I don't know how to use that? the sewing machine. I've been sewing since maybe I was like six years old. So a long time. Yeah. We didn't have a lot as a kid. So first I started making clothes for my Barbies from just okay. like scrap materials. And then I would um, like make skirts for myself out of curtains yeah. or if I outgrew jeans, turn them into skirts. And I kind of just, um, my mom initially taught me how to sew, sew like holes in our clothes. And I kind of just taught myself more along the way because I really enjoyed it. So this it. is be an ignorant question, but in Panama, Mexico, mm -hmm. it, it's Spanish to both places, right? Yes. Okay. So it's not like a Panamanian language. <laughs> oh, no. Every, I feel like every country that speaks Spanish has their own dialect. Okay. So not all the words are the same, but they definitely can communicate okay. with okay. one another. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so what's something like when you first started as an entrepreneur, like you struggled with, right? Like you kicked your butt. But now you're looking back like, how, how did I struggle with this? That, that, that was so easy. What was wrong with me? Like, what was I, what, what you like? Why did I struggle so much? Uh, organization. <laughs> uh, just all the logistical processes of um, owning a business was difficult for me because I am, I do have a bit of ADHD and I do, I am a creative. So it's just like all over the place. But in order to have a business, even as a, if it is based in art, like you have to get a hold of all those things, like getting your, your calendar in order and making sure you plan out your day, especially because I do have four kids and I do all my emails on this day and I'll answer everybody on this day. So just getting, putting in systems and processes and organization has been the most difficult thing. And even now, even though I've come a long way, it's still like more to go. <laughs> And your business, they set up Renton? Uh, we work in Renton. I have a contract right now with the Bellevue Art Museum, um, a contract with the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. So I'm not just stagnant in one place. Like okay. currently we're operating out of like six cities, I believe. They split yeah. up just a little bit? Yeah. Um, so when you started your business, was there any like organizations around that helped you out to get started? Or you just like relied on friends who did this before? Like how do you? What kind of advice what was that? Um, so I do have three women um, mentors. One of them is the CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. And then Dr. Linda, of course, owns the nonprofit. And then Miss Benita, she's been working with city and government entities for years. Okay. So a lot of the times when it comes to navigating certain things, I've been really blessed to be able to just call them and ask questions 
And if they don't know the answers, like they're more than happy to connect me to the right person. And I think um, sometimes when we don't know things, like our ego gets in the way and we don't want to ask, I don't, I will ask. Like, I do not feel any type of way saying like, I'm actually not good at this. Can you please help me? You know? Yeah. So. One thing I suck at <clears throat> is like, I suck at following up and I, I suck at asking for help, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some things that you kind of quote unquote like, suck at as an entrepreneur? Yeah. Just what you said, asking for help. <laughs> um, I feel like my business is in a space right now where it could grow uh, really big. Our impact for sure can grow really wide. And I can't continue at this space doing it solo. Um, so I do have three to four people that are currently, I guess, interning to be a part of the business side um, of things. And I'm hoping that that works out well. But it did take me a long time to feel comfortable enough to do yeah. that. It's what's funny, like you always <laughs> want to help people. They ask you, what do you need from me? You're like, yeah, like, I kind of got brain lock, right? Yeah. Uh, like, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, everything. <laughs> like, yeah. And because you don't like tell them everything, then you don't want to burn them, you know? Yeah, exactly. I have to get back yeah. to that. Um, so you you talk about your three mentors. Are you mentoring anyone yourself? Um, it's funny because I wouldn't have thought like I'm in a position where I could mentor someone. But one of the gals that is actually stepping up um, on the business side of things, she did refer to me as that the other day. And I was like, ah, that's so weird, but really cool. <laughs> um, as far as your business model, talk about how you figure your business model out. Like, like, like what? Like who your customers are, you're gonna go after like your mm -hmm. pricing. Like how do you figure all that out? Like what to charge? What uh, to charge? Oh, the pricing, the pricing thing is pretty difficult. A because I have a problem charging X amount of money, I always feel bad. Um, but I understand in order to continue the business, like it has to be able to sustain. Yeah, I mean, it, you're so. not a nonprofit, right? Man, no, we're not a nonprofit, but we kind of operate as such. Um, so every time we have an event coming up, like all expenses are covered through community partnerships and sponsorships. So there's usually not a um, a profit off of them. Um, and I think for the longest time, we've just been focused on impact over income. But again, like in order to scale that impact, like we have to get employees, which requires income. So working on that. Yeah, so it seems like you look, listen to stats, most small business startups fails in the first five years, right? For, for, for like a, a, a lot of reasons, right? Yeah. What do you think you've been able to like make it so far? Like, how can you have it closed down? What's been your secret to success to keep on going, so to speak? Um, my work ethic, I think, has a lot to do with it. I, I really think that when I came to a point where I'm like, okay, I want this business to not just sustain me, but I want it to sustain my family and um, my associates and their family. And when I had that, I guess, like realization or goal, I really had to be honest with myself and say like, oh, well, how are you going to get there? Fancy, like with all this stuff on your plate, like, what are you going to do? And it, it's really like just keeping me myself accountable to what I need to do because people are reliant on me has been really helpful in order to um, keep growing my business and keep it at this momentum um, is just really keeping myself accountable and working hard. Like, understanding that yeah I, I am still a full stay-at-home mother and i am my children's primary caregiver but on the off times i'm not watching netflix i'm making up pitch proposals and i'm writing 15 emails and making sure that billing is taken care of and every extra minute will go back into me reinvesting in my business and sometimes it makes it difficult to have relationships and friendships because a lot of the time, people that you're close to will take it personal, and it's not. It's just I want to be able to, I want to be able to hang out with you, but why can't we hang out in Paris? Like, let me work for the next five years, and then we can do that. And you're still important to me, and I still love you. And but right now, like, you have to have priorities. So I think sticking to my priorities and my work ethic and being accountable to myself. Yeah, I think it's the one thing new entrepreneurs mess up on, like. They, they forget, like, you're going to start a business. You got to tell your, obviously, your spouse, or you mm -hmm. got to tell your friends, too, right? You got to tell yeah. your friends, hey, no, you should go hang out every Thursday night. Mm -hmm. I can't do that no more. Yep. You know, we should, like, do all these different things. And we can't do that no more, right? Yeah. A lot of people fail to do that, right? And then the friend gets jealous, whatever, and, like, what's, what's, what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. they to do that. Yeah. I'm lucky because I get to work with so many amazing people who I've uh, developed friendships with. 
And I think too, from like my other friends that I've had before I started my business or who aren't in my business with me, that that's hard because it's like, oh, look, like she's doing this and this. Like, yeah, but I'm working. I just got lucky because my work is fun. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of answered this before, but when you decide to start a business, why a PR business? Why not like mm-hmm. of all the different things you know, why specifically PR? Well, after putting together the protest and Juneteenth, uh, during that time, it was COVID. So we had lost, I think, almost 30 businesses at the time where I, when I started putting this stuff together. And one of the business owners that I connected with through organizing the Art Walk, she reached out and was like, hey, you know, you did a really good job on the Art Walk, and I'm really impressed with um, everything you've been able to accomplish on your own. I want to start a pop-up market. Will you help me? Again, still was weird that people were looking to me for business <laughs> things. I'm like, okay, I'm literally just yeah, changing somebody's like, diaper. You're like, like, there's weird. no one else you can go to. Like, yeah. you're like, well, are you kidding me? Yeah, like, like, this, <laughs> this must be a scam. You must be trying to take like, it. You don't get out much. Yeah. Like, so that was difficult to kind of get used to. But um, through that, we put together these pop up markets that help drive foot traffic in downtown Renton, um, COVID, and they had a lot of the streets ripped up and we wanted our surrounding businesses to be successful. Um, so after I did that, I got to learn and uh, about the process of working with vendors, small business owners and growing relationships with them. And I'd sit down with them and learn about their business. And through that process, I'd be like, hey, well, have you ever thought about doing this? This would be really great with this demographic. And I'm just like, shit, like, I actually have a lot of really good ideas. What can I do with this to help? like my fellow small business owners. And I kind of, again, went back to Google. What is a job that I could do, like uplifting other businesses and advertising other people's things? And PR came up and I dug into that. And I remember calling my best friend I grew up with in Maryland. I'm like, hey, I think I'm going to start a PR business. And she's like, of course you are. (laughs) Like, why wouldn't you do that? Like, that's literally who you are. And I'm just like, damn, like, it's funny how it brought me back to a lot of the things about myself as a child. So. It's funny, like, how much so many of us, like, underestimate what we can do, right? Yes. <laughs> like, or always think we're not good enough, whatever the case may be, right? Mm-hmm. And, of course, some of us, like, think we're too good, right? We're like, you know, like, no, you're not that good. <laughs> and and the ones who are, are good, like, they put themselves down, unfortunately, right? Which yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, how did you get involved in art? You always been involved with art? I've always loved art. I used to paint a lot when I was younger. Um, but then when I had kids, I kind of stopped painting for myself and it would just be like little mommy art projects. Um, So I think the little activist in me has always been there. Uh, My mom, she protested a lot in her country about racial equity as well. And I think from the time we're very little, we've always just been taught, like if there's a way that you could help someone or stand up for someone, especially when they can't on behalf of themselves, then you should. Um, and when you see inequities or something that you know isn't right, like say something. Um, so I remember like even in middle school when they had the the curriculum where they taught you about slavery and they the teachers wanted us to watch Roots, Glory, uh, and Amistad. And... I told my teacher, I'm like, I'm not watching this. And she's like, well, you have to watch it. Like, as part of the curriculum, you get credit for this. What grade were you? I was in seventh grade. And I'm like, I'm not watching this. I'm not going to allow you to tell me who we were and what we came from. Like, I know that we come from kings and queens. This slavery shit was just a period in time. And you guys just basically use it to try to keep us in order. And I picked up my desk and I sat it in the hallway and... Um, I looked at her, I said, and you can call my mom if you want to, because she'll agree with me. (laughs) And I didn't get in trouble for that, actually, because my mom did agree with me. Um, And so that little activist has always been active in me. So when the whole BLM movement happened, uh, I was, I don't know if happy is the right word, but I was ready to go out and protest. And I did in Seattle and that wasn't safe for the kids. So what was a good way for you know, kids to express their feelings is art. So I know when I was little, I turned to art a lot. And uh, most of the time it was through music or performance art. Um, But any style of medium has always been kind of therapeutic for myself. 
So uh, merging the activism in me and the love of art, putting together that protest was kind of something that uh, meant a lot to me. So, so we'll go back to art in a minute. Yeah. Go back to protesting. Like, two part question. Why do you think it's important for people to protest? I mean, whatever the left, right, middle, whatever they're at, why do you think it's important for people to protest? And the more important part, like, does anything really get changed by protesting, right? Does mm -hmm. any laws get changed? You know, does the things where you work, does anything really change by the protest, you think? What's your opinion on that? Um, I think it's important for people to protest because a lot of the times communities who are underserved, like their voices are not held to the same standards as our counterparts. And the saying um, that riots are the language of the unheard, like it takes a community and a people to a time to build up that frustration to where it's like enough is enough, you know? Um, and do I think things change through protests? I do. I think um, this, this last one was particularly effective because as a world, as a society, we had been forced to sit down and just be quiet and like fully pay attention. We weren't distracted by our everyday lives and parties and bars and even work. We were just stagnant in one place and silent and still. And um, because the protest happened at that time, I think that it allowed a lot of people who may not necessarily have would have had time to listen or even care to actually like hone in and pay attention and listen and and most importantly, understand uh, what people were trying to say. So from I do your, think from your point of view. Mm -hmm. So sorry to interrupt you, but from yeah. your point of view. Do you think, and, and when I say better, whatever better is your definition, right? Yeah. Do you think things are better now than before all, this, all, this, all the protests? Honestly, I, after the BLM movement, I did see a lot of uh, businesses, corporations, entities step up to want to fight for equity um, and actually start doing the work. Uh, whether it was genuine or they felt forced to is irrelevant because the work was being done. Um, but now that the media attention has um, stepped back from covering the inequities and the, the police killings, you see a lot of those uh, corporations and businesses who had made the commitment prior start to back off from their commitment because they don't have the spotlight on them any longer. And um, that's why I continue doing the community work now, even after the protest, because I do want to be a person who is able to hold these businesses and these corporations and these entities accountable like hey remember a few years ago when you were monopolizing off of all that black lives matter with your merchandise and your marketing and your advertisement well keep that same energy because the shit still matters and you still need to do the work yeah i you think know? the biggest market now is like microsoft recently got rid of all the DI programs at least that's how everybody uh -huh. it, right yeah of course it's, you, you can't you know rely on and use anymore enforce it right so yeah uh, I don't know if it's true or not. I just remember back in the day when this all started, this micro CEO was like, we'll never get rid of this program that's here for life. And now, like you said, the spotlight's gone and it's mm -hmm. supposedly got rid of it all. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. So um, back to art. Are there any like great works of art you've seen personally, like the, mm -hmm. like the Mona Lisa or the Statue of David or anything like so that? So when I was in New York with my daughter for her dance intensive, I got to see the Van Gogh Starry Night, the real one in person, and... Yeah, I have the fake one in my house. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. Like, the things that I've seen on TV or photographs yes, or prints, no, it does person, not right? do it any justice. Like, there's so much beauty in each brushstroke. Like, I, I literally stood there for, I think, an hour and just memorized the whole piece. It yeah. was incredibly it's beautiful. So beautiful right? Yeah. It's the genius of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah it's crazy how... Good art, artwork is right. Mm -hmm. um, so, as far as art, is anyone you drawn to? Like, is it paintings, sculptures? Um, is it different. Well, I might be a bit biased, but I know like a lot of the artists that I work with are incredibly amazing. Um, I really enjoy. There's a good handful of them who are incredibly innovative in their approach, and their pieces have depth. Yeah. And every material and every image that they incorporate into their piece is methodical and it means something. And I love that. Um, there's an artist that I work with. Her name is Sade Barker, Maris Melanin. Her particular work is has the capacity to evoke emotion. 
And I think that that's hard, especially given uh, certain hard subject matters to be able to create emotion like through your piece that things actually have made me cry just looking at them. Yeah, I know recently they did a, I don't think the program had a lot of artists like Peyton Murrow's in the downtown area, like kind of beautiful oh, downtown area. Yeah. yeah. Seattle know, Restored? Yeah, I think that's okay. what it is. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you might not know the answer to this question, but there's a term starving artist for a reason, right? Yes. So like, how do you advise these artists that you know, like, like to be better business people, so to speak? Um, so I think for that, that's kind of has been my role to sort of act as an interme intermediary between organizations that want to have art or want certain art projects to be uh, facilitated, but with the understanding that they will be paying the artists instead of just think, saying like, oh, you're going to do this for exposure. Um, and that that even within itself is something that I've had to learn throughout the way. And I I will have people be like, oh, well, do you think one of your artists can do this for me? I'm like, yeah, but what is your budget to pay them? And I'll let you know what they'll be able to do. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of the artists who are fully in the creative mindset they don't think about that kind of stuff they don't want to think about that kind of stuff and um it's helpful for them for me to kind of come and play the middle person for them so yeah. i think you'll like this story so a friend of mine matt rama he's a photographer right mm -hmm. he's been a photographer for like maybe five ten years you know for a while right um and one time he he's he went to this dentist and said hey do you want me to i can photograph your dinner shop you know miss this whatever Mm -hmm. And then I said, yeah, sure. I want you to photograph for me, but I want you to do it for free. And that way you just use my pictures on your portfolio to get yourself exposure. Mm -hmm. And Matt said, that, that'll work. Oh, by the way, I need um, some braces. Can you do it for free? And my mouth would be like a portfolio <laughs> for you. Yeah. And the dad's like, of course not. Well, then, you know, shut the yeah. up. Yeah. You, you know, like, no. Yeah. 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 Like, they never think about the other way, right? Yeah. And I think societally, uh, we have to start shifting the narrative that art or artists, like that's not a real job. Well, they actually took a long time to to learn that skill set. And if you could draw, you would, and you yeah. can't. So you got to pay for it. Yeah. You know? Um, top of this question. Let's suppose someone's out there, they're trying to be an artist, whatever, painting, whatever it is. But like, they're actually not that good, right? Like, wouldn't I, I mean, like, I mean... I mean, like, if I draw something for you, like, Jason, that has to be the worst thing ever in the history of the world, right? So, like, if I was an artist trying to make an artist trying to draw some bullshit, right? How, how, like, how do you tell that person or me, hey, hey, Jason, let's, let's reassess this. Let's, let's just take the artwork to, like, 10 artists and see what they say, right? Like, how do you, like, you know, because you don't want to question anyone's dreams because they Man. might want to know. They might think, you know, yeah. they won't lie to them or something, you know, but, like, how do you, like, do that? Honestly, like, I have to be honest, and I have not had that conversation with someone, I don't even know how to approach that yeah. because it's like, I will just start to cry yeah. myself before they even hear the words coming out of yeah. my mouth. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Cause, um, have you heard of a place called central saloon? No, so it's, it's two door, two, two doors down. Suppose it's, it's been open since 1892 mm -hmm. and like Nirvana started their pro jam, all these iconic settle bands that started. Right? Wow. And they still have live music. Two or three bands playing live music every night, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't go near it enough, of course, because it starts, starts kind of late, like eight, eight or nine. Eight or nine oh, okay. nights is kind of late. But I've been there four times, and maybe just when the times I went, yeah. every time I go, a band plays. You're like, oh my god, you're so good, right? Like, yeah. what are you doing here? Right? You should be like, sound like stadiums right now. Yes. <laughs> Next band comes on, like y'all must have no friends. Oh yes. Because I just want to cut my eardrums out right now. Like you're horrible. Like and like no one's told you how much you suck. Like good lord. <laughs> That's like the everybody gets the trophy culture yeah. we're in. Yeah. No, that's that's true because some people are like, why? You know, like when I'm talking to my children about things, oh, that's not nice. I'm like, it is nice because they have yeah. to hear the feedback I mean, from their mother the truth instead the truth, of right? someone out in the world that's going to crush their soul. Yeah. You know, I always say the truth's not mean, the truth's the truth. Yeah. yeah. The truth is the truth. And like with a good band's playing, that place is packed, standing room only. Yeah. The bad band starts playing within 30 seconds, it's like empties out. And yeah. Everyone goes to the street and just come back. Well, then that's play. their review. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Yeah. Um, so, how long were you in New York City with your daughter? 
Oh, we went for two weeks. Okay. Yeah, we went for two weeks. And she doing some kind of dance recital or something? Yeah, she got accepted into Joffrey Ballet School Summer Intensive. Okay. She's she's pretty amazing. Uh -huh. And I'm not just saying that because I'm her mom. Like, she's yeah. actually really incredible. And how old is she? She's 14. She's still doing that? Yeah, she's still dancing. I'm really excited to see what she does with her gifts. Is there any kind of, like, I don't know, private ballet school, like, gifted people here that she can um, do? Or... No, they have, well, they have plenty of dance schools. Um, the, I guess, like, the premier ballet school in Washington probably is the Pacific Northwest Ballet School. Okay. Um, and that is more for dancers really focused on the style of ballet. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did talk to my daughter about that, but she loves contemporary and jazz okay. and um, modern dance and lyrical more than ballet. So I figured that that would actually just make her miserable. So <laughs> yeah, so she's trying to try to get. I don't know. I don't know if Juilliard's like a college or high school, but she can try to get to something like yeah, Juilliard. Yeah, it's a college. Okay. Yeah, we've talked about that yeah. and um, looked into other schools that have like a good dance program. I told her to start doing that. Um, she's very attached and has always said that I don't want to go to college, like where I'm not living here with you. And I'm like, dude, relax. Yeah. I'm going to be here and go live your life. <laughs> and she's only 14. So yeah. Change, but like, she wants to be like a classical ballet, ballet person, like dance on Broadway. Yes. I think Broadway would be something she'd enjoy or performing with some sort of musical act would be something fun for her. Um, she has already like come up with her second act and she's like, when I can't dance, I'll just be a teacher. I'll teach dance. Um, so I think that's cute. Like she really enjoys doing dance. Yeah. Um, you name your company Elevate PR. Does that mean, is that, is that mean anything or is this a random name? Uh, so when I first started my business, like people would be like, Oh, what do you do? I'm like, well, I could be your number one hype man. And like, everyone's like, you should make that your business name. I'm like, no, that's not very professional. So I just Googled synonyms for hype and elevate was uh, one of the words that came up that I feel really resonated with me. And that's the letter of my first kid's name. And then PR, P was for my son. And then M was for my other daughter. So. And how do you find your customers? They usually find me. Okay. Yeah. Like when I work with um, like city of Renton or city of Auburn, it's usually for a specific project uh, for the Bainbridge art museum. They found my pop-up market business online and our relationship and business partnership grew from just popping up in their museum to curating shows for them. And then for the Bellevue art museum, I just, I knew they were there. I had never gone to that museum before. I was working at Legion at the time, and I just decided to pop over and introduce myself and ask if they'd be willing to work with me, and they did. I think I saw your Instagram today or yesterday where you're going to do Bainbridge again in 2025. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, so I'm excited because we are. We just finished our meeting talking about the contract for next year uh, regarding programming for Black History Month and an art exhibit that will open on January 18th and run from uh, January 18th to the last day in February. So I'm excited about that. The um, theme of the show is going to be called Radiant Reflections. And opposed to the Black and Bougie show, that was incredible. This show will be smaller, uh, more intimate in regards to the artists that are participating. But I'm really excited to continue the conversation that started uh, through Black and Bougie with this show. One of the best things that I heard feedback from our guests and our audience from Black and Bougie is that they were very grateful that we curated a show that was focused on our beauty and not our pain. Um, and that really resonated with me. So I wanted to continue that conversation of Black beauty, of the people, whether it be their features or our culture, that really does influence so much of American society. So, so is artwork basically like you had like 10 artists put their put their art up and the people just walk around looking at it? Is that, is that pretty simply what it is? So this art walk, we actually had 30 featured local Black artists. Uh, we were at the Bellevue Downtown Park, and yes, people just were able to walk um, along the promenade and shop with the artists and see their work and talk to them and learn more about them as well. So how do you, like, I'm sure, I'll make this up maybe, but, like, I'm <laughs> sure you might have, like, 100 artists apply Mm -hmm. like a limited number of slots. How do you determine like who actually gets to display their art? 
Uh, so this is actually the largest number of artists that I worked with on a project. Um, there were some people at the end, maybe like 10 additional artists who wanted to participate, but because marketing had already started and we already did our promo shoot, I couldn't really take anyone on. But for those, I just tell them to, you know, just keep an eye on for the next announcement so that you can apply when we put out our artist call. So you do these in Renton, Bellevue, and Bainbridge? Renton, yep. And we've worked in Seattle as well before. So, okay. yeah. Any other cities out in the area you want to like reach out to and like, like, yeah, there? I would love to do something in uh, Kirkland. That's, and Redmond already has a big thing. And I also would like to do something um, in Edmonds by the water. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Edmonds Bowl would be a great place to do it. I yeah. Think. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's a place in Kirkland I've been like two or three times. It's right by the water. I, I don't know if it, this name has the name. But it's right by the water. It's all these like restaurants and bars. Like people sit outside all the time. I like mm -hmm. that place right there. Okay. I, I, I wish I knew the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And then, so for the for the art for the artist, right? What do they get out of doing this, right? Do they like do they have to pay a fee to you to be part of it? Yes. And like like or do like post. You know, Mary Jane sells a piece of art for a hundred dollars. Yeah. You get a cut of it. Like, how does all that work? So for the art walks, they just pay a minimal booth fee. I try to keep it as low as possible, dependent on what the cost of producing the event is. Um, for the pop up markets and the art walk, every bit of the booth fee goes to producing the event, and it's not a prof profitable venue for myself or Elevate. Um, so it really just depends on the cost of the event and whether or not we've been able to acquire sponsorship for the event. So when we're working with um, like Bainbridge for the exhibit, they don't pay for that because the, I'm contractor to the museum, not to the artist. So that's a free opportunity for them. When I work with uh, the Hyatt for our annual Black Makers and Creatives event in February, that's free for them because I donate my time to the Hyatt and all proceeds are given to a nonprofit black owned business that operates here locally. So it depends on uh, who we're partnering with and the cost of the event. So talk about some of the challenges of putting on an event, right? I think some people go to an event, they think mm -hmm. it's like, this happens, right? Yeah. But like, it does not just happen, right? There's like hundreds and probably thousands of little details you have mm -hmm. to worry about. So you talk about that. Yeah. So permitting is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, Super not fun. And I cannot wait to meet someone who is willing to take that off my plate. Um, but depending on what cities we're working with, I do enjoy working with the people who run like the licensing department. And I try to focus on that instead of the annoyance of all the deadlines and the fees and the applications. Um, and then also, there's always things that happen last minute. Um, We'll have like a DJ. Oh, I can't make it today. Okay, crap. Now I got to find a DJ to be at the event in literally three hours and hoping that they're still win willing to come in in our budget and not charge us extra for contacting them last minute. Um, we will have, you know, people not show up, like vendors not show up to their or communicate. And for the stuff like that, mm -hmm. like the DJ, like you, like the DJ doesn't show up the last minute, right? You mm -hmm. then put a note, never deal with the, never deal with this person again. Like, yeah. Like, so Mental note. Like, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because although I really enjoy like the relationships that I build with these uh, vendors that I get to work with at the end of the day, like it's not just me and them. It's like us, them and like 50 other people that are dependent on your one job that you were supposed yeah. to do. But you probably put all of the social media, DJ, so-and-so, so no. right? <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> But it's just like personal note, like no, you no, won't I mean, get. I the... mean, like before the event coming for your drop. Oh yes, yeah, you probably absolutely come to the event, see DJ so and so. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So that also is like shit. Now I look dumb. False advertising. Yeah, you now I look up. dumb because that was actually not true because you did not show up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Um, so talk about this uh, Blake the thing in February, the Black Makers event. The Black Makers and Creative. Yeah. Okay, so Black Makers. <laughs> Black Makers and Creative is a partnership that um, Elevate has with the Hyatt. This, or in 2025, will be our third year doing this. First year, we did it in their SIP lounge with the maximum, maximum occupancy of 75 people, and that went really well. 
so this year we actually got to do it in one of their small ballroom, um, which I really enjoyed because we got to incorporate a fashion show this year. And I got to work with a fellow community organizer and a friend, Jerrica, and she was amazing. Um, actually got very sick this year, so I didn't get to stay and actually be a part of the event, which made me really sad after working on it. But everybody seemed to have a really good time and the artists enjoyed their self. And um, in 2025, we're planning to actually use the grand ballroom for this event. So it's really been exciting to see it evolve over time. Um, and I'm most excited for this year because the space allows me to be able to really work on bringing to fruition the whole vision in its entirety. So, so what to you, what does it mean to be a creative? What does that word mean? Um, I think that the final definition of it is having an idea, but actually doing it. Um, because I think that we all can have amazing ideas, but are you actually going to do it? Do you know how to do it? Are you willing to find out how to do it? You know, are you really willing to see it from inception to creation? So, um, when does someone realize they're creative? Like, like you wake up one day at five or six, like, man, I'm creative, <laughs> or like, are you just something you learn over years, or, or is it part of the environment too, right? Yeah. Yes, I think all the things. Uh, for me, the realization for myself came later on in life, even though through conversation, I've found that other people have always viewed me as that. Um, and I've always been into art and creating things and doing things differently. But environment, like you don't get nurtured in a way of, wow, like that was a really good idea. Maybe you could do this when you get older. It's more of like, why are you messing with that? Like, why are you doing that? Like, why are you getting into everything? Um, and I think that's why even with my kids, when they're doing something naughty, even if it was naughty, but it was a really good idea and extremely innovative, I've always tell them like, hey, like you shouldn't have done this because these are the rules. But also the way that you did it, the the things that you came up with along the process, like that was a really good idea. Use your powers for good. <laughs> so like you've done a good job, like combining being creative or being a business person, right? Mm -hmm. Most people like creative, they can't make that transfer, like being yeah. like, kind of both right. Why have you been successful? It's like combining being creative with being a business person. Um, because of my upbringing, I think that being first generation, um, naturally I'm just a hardworking person, but being first generation, it like, it gives you something in here. It like instills that never give up. Like you have, like you've come from this lineage and all these things were given up and sacrificed for you to be here. Take advantage of the things that you had because just one generation ago, like y'all didn't have shit, you know? Uh, so I think that that has helped. And I really, as hard as motherhood has been, um, like my experience with it, I 100% believe that I was supposed to go through that in order to prepare me for this. Because even on my really hard work or entrepreneurship days, I tell myself, like, you've been through worse and you've gotten through harder things. And if you can be a mom with four kids under five years old at one time by yourself most of the day, then you can do anything. <laughs> so talk some more about like the advantage or disadvantage of being a first um, generation immigrant as far as like just being a yeah. person in general living in the United States mm -hmm. and for your being an entrepreneur. Yeah, I think uh, for entrepreneurship, the advantages again has been the, the work ethic that has been instilled and the grit. Um, like, I don't, even if I fail, like, I'm not going to give up. I'm never going to give up. It's not an option. Uh, the disadvantages, I think, in entrepreneurship is not having, uh, how do you say, like a safety blanket, any security. Like, you're literally doing this shit on your own. Um, and even though, like, I have my mentors and I'm super grateful for them, uh, that is emotional and mental support. You still need... I think entrepreneurship there, I'm in a time where I'm like writing a grant almost every night because the financial security isn't there because we don't come from a family with money, a family with means, or even a family with roots. Like I'm just establishing the roots here. Um, and culturally, 
uh, or just everyday life. The advantages of being first generation is the culture. Um, I think that there's so much beauty in being a Latina and, and an Afro Latina. And I love that the, the camaraderie in our culture, I think has really helped me navigate my business and the way I do business because, you know, like growing up, there was four families, four or five families that lived in one three bedroom apartment and all the other parents went to work and Lucy stayed home and took care of us. So that cooperative like village mindset, I think has always been within me because of my cultural background. Um, and then obviously disadvantages everyday life of being first generation is the bullshit that I've had to deal with in regards to like government agencies or just uh, even law enforcement, you know, um, being coming back to the States from Canada and them seeing that I'm a Vargas on my birth certificate and seeing that my place of birth was California and having to stay there for three hours because according to him, oh, you're from California and you're Mexican. You know how you guys are. You need to step over here. So just things like that, that I think people don't think about um, that I have to navigate from time to time. And it is really frustrating, but I'm 36 now. And some of that I've kind of sadly gotten accustomed to. And I don't necessarily uh, let it bother me or stop me. Um, but it is unfortunate. So, yeah. It's like for immigration stuff going on right now. What If you had the power, what would you change about it? Like how can the system be improved, so to speak? I don't know. I feel like the fact that we have to have so many refugees and, and people influx into this country is really the problem. Like we complain about uh, immigration and people coming here, but then you're also the same people are like, oh, we can't get involved. We can't get involved into the conflict. And also the lack of knowledge of knowing how a lot of the times we're benefiting from these conflicts. Yeah. Um, so if you're not willing to, I guess, navigate having to give up the, the benefits you get from all this atrocity happening, then you really shouldn't be having, um, a say on how we're navigating all the atrocities that are happening because you didn't want to be involved in the first place. So um, it's just, there's always like that balance between making reasonable calls in regards to like the legal aspects of immigration and also humanity, the humanity of it all. Like how can you turn a blind eye, you know? Yeah. Of course, a lot of people say, no, there are no immigrants because bad people come over. I mean, obviously bad people come over just based on stats, right? Yep. But if people come over, some are going to be bad, right? Well, my right. thing has always been, if someone came all the way from, I'll say, Ecuador, right? Like, yeah. That shows a lot of great motivation, right? Isn't Absolutely. that the person you want in the United States? Absolutely. So, like, yeah. Yeah. There's, so, there's actually a lot of um, research that shows the immeasurable benefit that having a lot of immigrants have had on this country. Yeah. Um, their their uh, contributions to society. And that's also something that I feel like isn't talked about a lot. And it's like propaganda. Like, you want to talk about the negative, let's talk about the positive. Like, tell the story in its entirety, not just the things that you want to get people fired up about. Yeah, definitely. So um, what does it mean to you to be a leader? Um, to me, to be a leader means being accountable to your community. Uh, there have been a lot of times where you know, decisions have had to be made. And as a leader, I fully believe that you're always going to make the decision that's going to benefit the most and not yourself. Um, I think that the strongest show of leadership is leading through example um, and leading through work. There's a lot of people who are, who want to be in position of power without being willing to be a servant. And I don't think that you can be a good leader without serving the people that you lead. So. And then I think, I think this is your website. I found it somewhere. It, it says, um, and this is you, you talking. I'm most proud that I've built a purpose-driven business. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to be a purpose-driven business? Uh, to me, it means that I've built something that is um, beyond me. It's not focused on me. It's focused on the community around me. 
the every part of my business, all our subsidiaries has been created in order to serve a need in our community. Um, and even the like private clients that I may have that are not community based, I have those clients in order to support the community work that we're doing. And about how many clients do you have right now? Um, so entities, maybe like three or four, meaning like larger businesses, and then private clients, same like three or four. And the, I suppose technically all the artists are my clients because yeah. the work that I do on behalf of them, I don't charge them for. Um, and there's like maybe 75 of them. Yeah. And so what's your max you can go? Like, can you have like 20 more clients, 30 more clients or like, or like what's your max? <laughs> Um, I think the artists, there's not going to be a cap because a lot of those things are, uh, I guess, managed at, on a group effort. Mm -hmm. So if we have a project, then I communicate to everybody at one time. Okay. Um, as far as private clients, I don't, for myself, until I have a team built, I don't like to have more than like six things going on at a time. I feel like that's my capacity without having things fall through the cracks. And how do you deal with a client that will say like kind of like too needy, right? They're like calling you every day, emailing you 27 times a day. Like how you deal yeah. with that? Uh, so I have a business cell phone number. And when I do communicate with people, I make sure I let them know like this is my business cell. And during, if I don't answer, that means I'm not available. Um, but my being a stay at home mom and my kids being on summer break, like currently I don't have summer or any work hours. It's just like whenever I get to y'all, I'll get yeah. to y'all. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then also, I think I've started part of this more too, but it said like you learned how to do delayed gratification. Oh, yeah. Talk about the process of you learning that. Okay, so that's a funny story. I actually, um, before I started my business, maybe like a year or two before uh, the BLM movement started, I had met a friend, her name's Emily, and she invited me to this thing that I didn't know what it was, and it ended up being like one of those Amway um multi-level marketing things and although i realized like sales is not for me like i'm not gonna ever convince someone that this skin cream is good for them and blah blah like i don't i don't like to do that it's weird it feels weird the things that i learned along the process and working within that business uh really were invaluable their mentorship their mentorship that they have set up within the Amway business is absolutely incredible. And honestly, like I considered staying on just to, for the people, just for the mentorship, just for the business lessons that you were able to learn and how they taught you. And um, I learned a lot through the reading that they recommended John Maxwell. And if you've never read, read The Go-Giver and you're an entrepreneur, like that is an excellent book for you to read, especially if you have the mindset to build a purpose driven business. So definitely, I learned a lot from that whole Amway process, even though it's not where I ended up. So back, uh, when you said you talk about, you know, how you, you never give up, you have a lot of grit. Mm -hmm. Have you ever times like, yeah, like you never have you ever times like you notice a kid, like getting too easy, you're like, kid, if you don't get your butt up and yeah. finish this. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I just tell them like, we don't quit. That's not what we do. Like, you want, especially my older daughter, because she's 14. So I feel like this last year and a half, she's kind of been going through that whole growing pains emotionally as a teenage girl. And there's been so many times where she's said like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. Like this is dumb in regards to dance. And I'm like, no, like you don't want to do, you don't want them to move you up to the next class because that was hard for you. And you're so used to everything coming easily to you because you are incredibly talented and you are a hard worker. So you don't get to give up just because something got hard and you don't want to try. You don't get to do that. What are some like, I'm presuming you do, you do a lot of networking stuff, right? What are some good networking events people should attend? Uh, so, I've, yes, I'm always going to encourage people to join me at the Renton Chamber of Commerce Monthly Mixers. Uh, I really think that that specific chamber of commerce is really good at supporting from within, meaning that all chamber members, regardless of need, will always go to other chamber members um, to provide them business before they go outside the network. And there's also a lot of openness and willing to collaborate on different things. So that's been really fun to see all the partnerships that happen after the mixers and the 
new different things that they come up with working together. Uh, there's also, if we're very business focused, for for Black entrepreneurs, you can always check out Sync Seattle. They are have done a really good job creating a very inviting space, especially to people who are transplants, so that they don't have to suffer through the Seattle freeze alone. <laughs> yeah, sometimes seems like there's more Seattle transplants than born and raised people in Seattle. Yes, there has been a huge influx of people moving here. And I can see it in the traffic and the amount of people walking down the street. <laughs> yeah, we're definitely back to pre-COVID level traffic. Mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Um, now, what is this Black Love Market you, you're involved with? So Black Love Market is a monthly pop-up market um, that is focused on highlighting Black-owned businesses, Black educators, and Black performance artists. So Black Love Market is the pop-up market that's always featured in our Renton uh, Juneteenth celebration every year. We currently have a contract with the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art to be their featured pop-up market for their first Friday's art walk that happens on the island. And we're working on partnering with the Bell Red Art District to pop up there as well. So a lot of the times, like I said, people will find that specific business online and will ask us to come and pop up at things that they're doing. So like, I'm guessing Seattle has a pretty vibrant art scene, creative scene. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, of course, Seattle's known for music mm -hmm. and different things like Austin Nils music. So Seattle has a pretty vibrant art scene. So yeah. Speak. Yeah, they really do. I think that there's, um, I've been most excited this last year to really find new artists that I didn't know were here before and see different styles of art and different work and um, seeing people approach art differently. Um, I recently got to meet Moses' son, who is with the Vivid Matter Collective, and um, just hearing from him and like just getting to speak to him because to me, like, he's a famous person for me. Like, I'm like, oh my God, can I have your autograph? <laughs> just because of the work that he's done and the work that they've done together as a collective. And um, I feel like people are more free to be themselves here in Seattle, as opposed to uh, where I grew up in Maryland. So, okay. yeah. And what is this thing is called Hatchery Co-op? Oh, the Hatchery co <laughs> the Hatchery Coop. That was like, I believe like the first little thing that we launched and that was the pop-up market that i was referring to okay. that we did in downtown renton during covid um and it's a co-op because it was with in collaboration with four other women there was a space that we utilized that belonged to christy but she only used it on the weekends to do her cheese class so then laura who was a charcuterie maker she started renting out the space as well and then um pippa and i would operate the pop-up market out of the space. So it was a cooperative. And then there was also Annie, who's like the sweetest lady and makes hand -made, hand -made ch uh chocolate. Um, so that was kind of like the first little venture that I kind of worked on. And all these little projects, they're all underneath some, some something called the Creative Collective? Uh, the Cultivate, the Collective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Cultivate is, I guess, the art, retail, and sales side of the business. Um, Cultivate the Collective is in reference to the multitude of artists that we work with um, within the collective. And Cultivate, the vision for Cultivate is so large and I've always had like big dreams and plans for it, but I always kind of felt like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do that. But I think now in this time and in this space, working with the people that I'm working with, like I finally feel like a lot of those things are attainable. And it's been really cool to see the name recognition of Cultivate the Collective, like within the community. So what's a skill you don't have you, you want to learn either for your business or just for personal reasons? Um, I would like to relearn accounting. <laughs> and yes, I would like to hire an accountant, but it'd always be good to uh, have some in-house knowledge just for oversight purposes. <laughs> I'll be honest. I was not expecting that answer. Oh, really? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, yeah, that would be the last thing <laughs> for county, yeah. Um, so what are some things you got going on in the future that really excites you? Um, so on August 25th will be the very first time I am curating and producing a Latin-focused event. Um, I've spent a primary, 
primary amount of my business focusing in the on the black community and advocating and working with them. Um, so I'm very excited to do this to be able to share another piece of who I am with my community. What's the mistake you made in the past as an entrepreneur that you want other people to learn from? Mm, not asking for help. Um, thinking that, uh, I think too, like thinking that I had to prove, had something to prove because I don't come from like a traditional education and even a lot of the creatives that I work with, like they have degrees, you know, I went to Highline for business and entrepreneurship when I was pregnant with my youngest girls, but I don't have like a master's degree in art or I never went to school for curation. And I have just taught myself a lot of these things along the way. Um, so I think like self doubt and not asking for help when you need it have been the big mistakes that I've made along the way. So what exactly is a public relations firm supposed to do for someone? Um, help work on their relationships with the public. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it uh, from the way that we approach it with a lot of community engagement. Um, there's been some clients I've had to do image rehabilitation for because their standing with community has not been um, on good terms for a very long time. And I honestly feel like that's more so my superpower. I am very good at connecting with people in an authentic and genuine way um, because I did have to move around a lot when I was a little and I was always the new kid and I would never belonged anywhere and never fit in anywhere. And the, so the survival skill that I developed through that has really played a part in my uh, public relations business and career now as an adult. So like when, what, at what stage should business be at to start looking for PR firms, like that's the amount of revenue, the number of people, like mm. when sort of, so obviously like you're building your business, you probably don't need PR the first couple of years, right? Right. But so when sort of mm. business like start reaching out and like yeah, looking at that? I actually think that it's beneficial at any stage. Obviously the amount of um, what you can budget for, depending on the stage that your business in is going to fluctuate depending on where you are in your business. But like, if you're just starting your business and you don't have a big budget, we could just do a simple consultation where I will pre-create a general PR slash marketing plan for your business. And then we just sit down for an hour. I go over it with you, but then it's up to you to implement the plan moving forward. And then there's other levels to that. Like, oh, now you want me to sit down with you for four hours and teach you how to do it. But then you're still responsible moving forward after we place the systems in place to continue your own PR. And then there's other people who are like, hey, I don't want to deal with this shit at all. Like, just handle it for me 100%. And then we'll do that as well. So I love the fact you, you have your price on your website, right? Mm -hmm. but like me personally, I'll, I'll go to a website. I'm interested. There's no price. Like, yeah, I'm not going to call you up because, you know, I have no idea how the much is going to be. I'm gonna, yeah. I don't waste my time. <laughs> I'm going to tell this $10,000 an hour, right? Yeah. But a lot of people will say, don't put your pricing on there. Why did you decide to put your pricing on your website? I decided to put my pricing on my website because I feel like the work or the field that I'm in doesn't necessarily immediately have a value set on it when other people are like reaching out to me um, just because of what they see maybe on social media. Again, like a lot of the things that I do is fun, but it's still also a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes. So I wanted to have the price point on there because I need people to understand that there is a value put on the work that I do. And your pricing, I mean, I'm not talking about, I don't, I don't tell exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> but is that like locked in stone or are you flexible? On the no, price? flexible. I feel like those prices are more for um, like private market clients okay. who can afford it. And even dependent on the client and the impact that working with them will create, I'll even often lower those prices. And for community organizations, I usually give them like a 70% discount on my prices because I understand that they are a community organization. The impact that they're going to make is important and needed. So I'm willing to change my prices for them and help them make the impact because I'm a part of the community and that's also going to benefit me. And y'all do like social media for people too, like posting yeah. and like help them prove their following and stuff. Yeah. Like I, that's like kind of my fave to do social media. So for a lot of the artists, I will go to when they're doing different events and I'll 
um, you know, create reels for them and take content for them. There's an artist who's like one of my close friends who hates social media. Yeah. And for her, I'll create the content and I'll write the captions for her. And literally all she has to do is copy and paste and post. And can someone or not, I saw kind of like a company nonprofit that purchases a social media stuff place different mm -hmm. from anything else? Yeah. So yeah. How, how do you charge for that? Is it like, like per posting per month? Or like You can do per posting. And again, it just depends on what they want. Do you want a whole social media strategy? Because that's going to be like a consultation fee and not necessarily me implementing it. Do you want someone from our team completely running your social media? Then that's going to cost you something monthly. And depending on how much you can afford, will determine how many times we're active on your page for you. So let's suppose there's a nonprofit out there. Mm -hmm. And then let's just say they really want to prove the social media, right? But so mm -hmm. far, they suck at it, right? Let's yeah. say the, the company LinkedIn page maybe has 25 followers, one follow on Twitter, yeah. maybe 10 on Instagram. How does it work as far as like, y'all improving what they have? Um. So that would probably require uh, a long kind of a deep dive. <laughs> yeah, I'm long like, term. um, this one, this like, might money, be a money. six month contract, yeah. <laughs> you know, and if if that is the case, like you need us for six months to basically bring you to life online. What's your budget for that time frame? We'll divide that into the months and then we'll go from there. And next question about that, like. So how do y'all do this, right? Because a lot of like, obviously you want to see results in six months, right? Mm -hmm. And so a company might say, well, man, six months, what if six months gone and that's improved, right? Yeah. I, of course you can't, you can't guarantee it because you can't guarantee someone's going to follow them, right? Yeah. So how does that work? So for things like that, um, our clients like that, there's usually deliverables that are listed within the contract. We decide on the contract rate. Um, you know, we get 15% up front because of all the research that has been done for us to even start the project. And then the different ben benchmarks along the contract determine what the payout is. Okay. Yeah. Do you personally have a favorite social media? Person that I like? No, a, a per like a favorite social media platform. Oh, platform? Oh, yeah, Instagram. Instagram, <laughs> that's your go-to? Yeah. So why, why Instagram? Just because it makes videos and nice pictures and stuff? I don't, yeah, I don't know. I found it the most fun or... Maybe the platform has been the best way for me to receive information. So it's the one that I most often engage with. Um, Facebook, though, like in my marketing class, if Facebook was a country, they'd be like the third most powerful country in the world. So that's just has value within itself. So, so I make myself go on there. And luckily, the two platforms can interact with each other yeah. so I can work on both simultaneously. I haven't really... Works with Twitter, even though my friends are always like, how you don't have a Twitter is crazy because you'd be saying the most craziest things. Yeah. I'm like, I know, but I wouldn't know what to post on there. Like, I want a bagel. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's that would be the hard part. And so on Instagram, like, you do a good job, like, putting yourself out there, like, putting the camera in front of your face, whatever, I mean, the phone in front of your face. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not comfortable doing that, right? Yeah. So how do you, like, quote, unquote, train, like, a small business owner? Like, no, you got to, you know, yeah. Put this camera up and like do something, right? Yeah. Like, train them to do that. You know, I would first like to clarify that even though I do it, I'm also not comfortable with it. And <laughs> you I can't, you can't tell. I, I because there's so many, like I'm like, okay, I posted that 90 second video, but you didn't see that it took me 95 minutes <laughs> to fucking do it. And then I had to go back and chop up 75 <laughs> fucking video clips of me not laughing like a hyena or cussing at the camera and looking pissed off, you know? So it, it takes time and I'm still not comfortable with it, but I do recognize that I've come a long way from where I started. And I finally, like the other day I was in public and I had to do something and I needed to get it like posted right away. I'm like, fuck, like there's so many people around. I'm going to look like an idiot. But again, like the commitment to my business and where I want to be at, um, is more important than me feeling stupid in front of people that don't know me and aren't going to give a shit, you know? So how about this? Like you hear all these people say, you know, research the best time to post all that kind of stuff. Like I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't have time for that shit. Right. Yeah. I don't have time to research. I'm like, Oh, it's, it's one 25 PM. I got to post on Twitter Two ten, I got to post on TikTok. I don't have time for I just like, yeah, I can write. So yeah. what's your advice on that? So is that really, does that even matter? I mean, I think it kind of matters, but I think that also cultivating a time frame that makes the most sense with um, you, a time frame where you can actually show up like intentionally and authentically is the best thing. 
um, because a lot of times I don't use the little insight buttons to know what time to post. I have kind of gone off with what I've realized when the people that I want to reach are most active online and taken the data and meshed it with that and also taken into account like, well, I actually cannot post at 3 p.m. because that's when I'm in carpool and my kids are throwing fucking Barbies at my head. Yeah. So that's not going to work for me. Um, now the platform has evolved into allowing you to schedule a lot of the things. So that has helped. But if you don't interact when you're posting, then you don't get as much reach also. So taking into account when I have 15 minutes, that's it, like 15 minutes to intentionally yeah. and authentically interact with this platform. And then I don't have to think about this ugly thing for the rest of the day. <laughs> yeah. And of course, there's all these scheduling things out there. There's like Buffer, Hootsuite, mm -hmm. Smart Inquirer, or Later, where you can like, like they do the posting for you, right? Mm -hmm. And I, but most people, I think they'll say like, no, you, gotta, you need to post yourself because the algorithms can tell it, but outside third party does it. Yeah. It brings down your stuff, right? Your stuff. Yeah. And now Instagram has updated to where you can schedule it from within the app. And then if you have a business page on Facebook, you can schedule out to a month. Okay. And then what if you are doing that, I think that is still a good idea to have it automatically post at the time when you're available to interact with the app yeah. with the app. But then that allows you to not have to think about writing the captions yeah. in that time frame. Da 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 da. You can just go in when you know that the app posted it for you and interact okay. with the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think another thing people would like, I don't want to say mess up, but like someone like will go do a post, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll like only get like, we'll say maybe like 25 likes and they mm -hmm. get upset. Like, you got to realize like there's so much content out there, right? Yes. I mean, that's literally like 20 years of content. Yeah. Right? I'm like, and content is like, people don't realize content is not supposed to be it's like the TV show, people yeah. the books, podcasts. Yes. And you're competing in so much. So actually, I mean, you got 10 likes, of course, maybe you want 10 million, but yeah. 10, 10 people yeah. took the time to like it, right? Absolutely. And I think, too, there's also keep in mind that there's periods throughout the year where even content creators, all their shit is down. And summer, believe it or not, is one of those times because there's so much being shared that it's hard for you to compete with all of that on the algorithm because everybody, especially in Washington, like the content that's centered here, like this is the time where like you see a lot of people you haven't seen in a year because yeah. they don't like to come out the house and when it ain't hot outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, some stuff in Seattle in the summertime, there's like literally every week there's a, some kind of tech week going on, yeah. on climate tech week. There's like recently we had a pioneer music score festival here. Mm -hmm. There's like, I think last week there's a South Lake Union block party. Okay, I saw, I was wondering what that was. Capitol okay. Hill had their block party. Yeah. I mean, there's so much content you do in the summer. By to Seattle, like, yeah. it's just like, bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Like, like, it's like we do a year's worth of stuff in like eight weeks, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's hard to, um, as an event planner, too, to be mindful of all those things. So, like, constantly having to rethink the way that we're curating the events to make sure that people actually want to be there instead of going all the way to Seattle or all the way to Tacoma, yeah. you know? What are, what are some ways that small business owners can take better advantage of social media from your point of view? Um, honestly, when I meet with my clients, like the first thing I tell them is like, people are buying you and not just your business or your product. And I think that uh, not being afraid to show up as you are and who you are is the best investment you can make for your business because people really connect with, again, like the humanity of it all. Um, even in business, people are like business or business. It's like, no, it's not. Because when you are talking about uh, marketing and advertising and PR, like psychology goes into creating all of those things. When you have to think about how you're going to genuinely connect with people, you're thinking about the people. So when you're on social media, like I suppose an advice would be like, think about what you'd want to hear. Like what's something that would resonate with you and how it would resonate with you and try to take that approach. Because when we're walking around meeting people in real life, when we connect with someone is because we have things in common, but you don't know you have things in common if you're not willing to share the real parts of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So on Instagram, does it matter if you post like, like you do a regular post? or a reel, so a story, does that, any of that matter? Yes, I think that you need to be engaging uh, with the app and all its capabilities, which is why after TikTok, Instagram has done so much um, 
rebooting of all the things that you can do within the app in order to compete with the other platforms. Um, and now they have this thing called achievement. So the more that you yeah, I've recently seen that, yeah. yeah, the more you play around with the type of content that you're delivering and I have a collaborator on this post and so I got this achievement and I did three reels this week. So now I got this achievement and with every, which I didn't notice till the other day, but the more achievements you get, the more things you're able to do within the app. So like my business, my main business page, even after I post a reel and I forgot to add someone as a collaborator, I can go back okay. and add collaborators. But like on my personal page, on my fancy pants page, because that's, really just for me. Yeah. I'm not trying to hit any achievement. Uh -huh. um, I can't do a lot of the stuff that I can do on my business okay. app. Yeah. And Instagram stories that, that you post there that disappears after 24 hours? Yeah. Okay. So what's the advantage of posting on there if it goes away in 24 hours? Because people live on stories. Okay. Like you can be talking to your audience via story and redirect them to different things that they might not have seen on your feed. A lot of the times when we're following people, um, their stuff won't show up on your feed unless yeah. you're actively engaging with them on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah. Can you like do a story and like twelve hours later, like save it and repost it as a regular post? As a post, yeah. Okay. You can you can download it and then post it on your feed. So I used to be a big fan of Snapchat, right? I, yeah. I used to love Snapchat, and then they changed mm -hmm. stuff. I used to be able to go like do like a what's it called like um. Oh, filters, right? Do like different filters. Oh, yes. Like that podcast, <laughs> I could have done a filter, a geo filter, like put out like five miles out. We're doing this podcast. Oh, like, but it changed it all. And like, I don't think anyone uses it anymore. Okay. I'm sure people do, but like, yeah. I stopped. I really was only using it during COVID with the kids because of the filters. Like, they liked having fun on there and making little videos. Um, but I've yet to delve into incorporating yeah. it into communication. They should do all that stuff. They changed something and I try to figure out the new way. I just couldn't do it right. Yeah. I was smarter. <laughs> like, yeah, I've changed this up. Um, were you on Clubhouse when Clubhouse was like out of, out there? I was on Clubhouse, but I deleted it soon after because the following that it get you on other platforms wasn't genuine. It's just like you follow me, I'll follow you, but I don't even live next to you and I'm not gonna engage with any of your content. Yeah. Yeah. I think that thing has so much potential. They just went to shit like so. Yeah. Quickly, right? yeah. Yeah. And some of the rooms were like toxic. I'm like, what oh, is this? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to a couple rooms and like, like two people, like, you know, hoarding the conversation or mm -hmm. the, what did you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they started off good. I don't know. They made some tactical errors along the way, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think we need another social media platform? I don't want, no. No. <laughs> a, I don't want to learn anything new. Um, and there's already like a plethora of information coming at you at one yep. time. Um, and so that's always like a tricky balance too. like how much is too much. That's true too. Yeah. I know a lot of people are talking about, you know, the mental health impacts of social media kids. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a real thing or. Yeah. I think that the specifically for young girls, the like standard of beauty that a lot of social media pushes can be difficult for them to navigate and um like online bullying is real um and the kids it just has such a fast way of really messing up a kid's life depending on what things these kids are deciding to share so and it adds i feel like a lot of pressure on them individually okay um <clears throat> so you talk about the sun, but can you go into more detail, like how your business got started, your focus now, and like your big term vision for the company moving forward? Um, so started as just, you know, a mom trying to help her kids navigate some things, um, evolved into meeting some wonderful artists that I really, you know, like fell in love with them as people and as artists and believed in them and their work and um then wanted to step up and help them accomplish things that they wanted to do. And then now I think it's currently in a place where we are really one of the community organizations that is really making a lot of great impact, especially through the art. And long-term vision, again, is just to be able to build something that sustains myself and my family and continues to offer opportunities for others to do the same 
whether it be a position within the company or helping them build something that is their own, which I, I love that. I love to um, like meet people and we start working together and I always ask them like, what's your goal? Like what's something that you want to build for your family? Like, is there a way that we can partner together on another level to also help you build something that's your own? You know, I think that having a business where you want people to evolve past you um, is really like the big goal. Yeah. So suppose someone out there looking for a PR firm, mm -hmm. why should they pick yours versus someone else's PR firm? Um, creative approach. I think that, again, being a business person and a creative uh, has its benefits being surrounded by so many creative minds on a regular basis also continues to inspire me and help push me to do things in a newer, bigger, better, different way. So do you see yourself like doing this business, you know, like 10, 20, 30 years? Yes. <laughs> or, or do you see yourself building up as where it gets so big at like a big time PR firm wants to acquire you in the future? Um, no, if, if I ever sell, the business, it would be to someone within the company that I feel would be able to carry on what is important to the business, which is really like the heart of it all. And I think that when you sell to like bigger corporations, uh, there's always the risk of risking the soul of the business. And I never want that to happen. I always want it to be community focused and I want it to always be impact over income and always community over competition. So you talked about this some earlier, mm -hmm. going back to it. So a lot of think a lot of think people don't think get this right. Like, so when you hire someone, like you suppose you hire Tom Brown, you actually hire the whole family, right? Yeah. So you gotta you know, when you're trying to get business, you gotta get business and make sure Tom Brown can you know pay the mortgage or pay his rent and take care yeah. take care of his kids, right? Yeah. I don't think a lot of people get that right. Can you talk about how that impacts your decision making? So I have a lot of entrepreneurship friends and I wouldn't necessarily work with all of them. I think that for me, first and foremost, is someone's morals and values. Are you a person of integrity? And what integrity means to me, it could be something as minute of like, well, if I lie and say this, I, we can get all this stuff for free. Like, no, we're not going to do that because that's not right. Because now you're impacting their business and their family's income. So I think that um, being if someone is someone of integrity, if they're not willing to take the shortcut just because it's easier. Like you're willing to do the right thing, even if it's harder. That's definitely like a big thing. Someone that takes initiative because it is not helpful for me to help you help me. Like it's just more waste of my time. And also, like you said, a lot of the people that I work with have their own businesses. So paying attention to how they prioritize and value their own business um, will then translate to how they value and take care of my business. And that's by like doing the work and also how they're represented like in public. Like what are the type of people that you hang around? Like what are the type of things that you do? Um, how do people see you? Like all of these things are gonna impact me and my business and everybody else that we're working with and people who are dependent on us. Is it safe to presume that you speak Spanish? Yes, but not as much as I did when I was younger. Okay. Uh, when I was around six or seven, we were put in ESL. Um, and that's when we moved to Maryland because in California, a lot of our teachers spoke Spanish. So it wasn't necessarily like you have to know how to speak English. Okay. Um, and yeah, so I need to practice on it more to be more fluent than I am. Um, but if you like drop me in Mexico, I'll be fine. <laughs> so do you do any like outreach or any like business, like specific or like Spanish speaking only businesses? No, but I'd really like to start doing that. I've had, and that's why, um, our event this month on the 25th is I'm so excited about that to be able to branch out into that community. I've had so many people specifically after my black and bougie exhibit reach out and say like, um, we love the work that you're doing, but when are you going to start doing some of this work for our community? Because like we need it specifically the representation and the advocacy portion of your work. Like we need that, especially because you're connected and you speak English and a lot of us don't. And so that is something that I want to really focus on. And I'm hoping that these new interns or these people that I'm bringing on board to help will help alleviate this side of the business so that I can start growing that side as well. So how do you find these interns? 
Um, they're just people that I work with, like the four people that I'm working with college, now. College students, high school students. No, they they are adults. Okay. Yeah, and um, they own their own businesses that have crossed paths with my business, and have said or approached me like, "Hey, like, I would like to help you with Elevate. These are the skill sets that I have. How can I help you?" What's your take on this, right? So this is, this is a lot of like you would say, like call it like fill in the blank business. Like, I, like mm -hmm. example, like I'm a veteran. There's, oh. a, there's a lot of better owned business, right? Yeah. But like a lot of these better owned businesses, they're like almost like, and you can like fill any word you want to, black, Hispanic, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. They're like, hey, support me because I'm a better business, right? Yeah. Well, fine. I'll come to a couple of times, but you freaking suck each time I go. Like, I'm going to stop going, right? Oh, yeah. And then they get mad at you because, oh, my community doesn't support me. Yeah. Well, you're not a real business, right? Yeah. So what's your take on that? Um, Again, balance. Like, yes, I think. Specifically for veterans. I love veterans. I'm so grateful for you guys. I think that it takes a special person to be willing to risk everything for everyone. And um, I think that, yes, those type of businesses that deserve our support just because of that. But also that business has a responsibility to deliver a quality service. And you can't just expect people to keep coming just because if you're not willing to deliver a quality service. And the reverse side of that, you have like, you have a small business, go say a veteran business, they're actually doing the right thing. They're successful. Mm -hmm. And all their friends be like, hey, give me a discount. Hey, you know, mm -hmm. and like, look, you're not giving, you're not going to get a discount from Beyonce or yeah. these big, or Tom Ford or Nike. Yeah. Why are you expecting this small business owner to give you a discount? Absolutely. That even for me, like my uh, primarily, primary amount of my business comes from people I don't know and not from people. Uh, within my own circle. And I think as entrepreneurs, like that's the one of the first things we need to throw out the damn window. Like yeah. your friends and your family ain't going to build your business. No, Like it's difficult for people to see someone who started where they started from doing something better than them. Yeah, It's hard for them to have accountability to themselves and say like, well, Tommy's doing better than me because he worked harder than me. Although like I could have done that. But yeah, you, but you're not. But you didn't. But you didn't. Yeah, you're, yeah. Yeah. So obviously you couldn't. So a lot of ego gets in the way. I feel like for like friends and family. Yeah, that, that's a good you. lesson, right? Like you've been amazed how many people in your close circle you think should help you. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, they might like a post or do something. But as far as like actually yeah. real help. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. That's a hard lesson you got to learn. Yeah. 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 I think that it took me. So we're like in year four. It took me to year two to like give up those hopes and dreams <laughs> yeah so um tell me about the nickname fancy how that come about oh so when i was in sixth grade i had a best friend his name was alex um and i'm guessing that he saw it on the jamie fox show because my name is francesca and he just came to school one day and was like i'm i think i'm gonna start calling you fancy i'm like okay whatever that's totally right yeah which was random because it stuck and I wasn't even fancy like a fancy person then like I was a tomboy until I was like I don't know maybe like halfway through ninth grade yeah so he just called me that and then everybody ever since then has called me that yeah yeah um so is there anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about hmm no we talked about keeping people accountable talked about the event I think that's pretty much it yeah nice. yeah um can you share your social media or other ways for people to reach out to you yes so on instagram the business page is at elevate prm and that's e-l-e-v the number eight prm and then i have a personal page which isn't anything to write home about but that's fancy pants and you guys can message me on there as well and yeah. so you, you answer like the dms and stuff on Instagram. yes i answer everything myself okay yeah. nice. yep and you have like a personal assistant or are you doing all this stuff yourself? No personal assistant, okay. but here's hoping that we get to that point by yeah. Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you have like a, like a, some kind of business goal for yourself by the end of the year? Like by the end of the year, you want to have like a certain number of customers, certain number of revenue? Mm. Like what's the goal for next? By the end of yeah. the year, I would like to have someone who is set to be my executive assistant um, for growing purposes. I feel like that's necessary. And I feel like I would like to have my all the art exhibits already pre-planned for the next year ahead. Like I want to have my 
calendar solidified for 2025, no movement by the beginning of November of this year so that I can really start the year off with like a good foot of organization, already having my sponsorship lined up, already having all my marketing material planned for the entire year and just focus on promotion instead of all the other annoying things that have to be done behind the scenes. So how do you do your schedule? Like you like take two weeks vacation each year, you work seven days a week. Yes, like, I work seven days a week. Okay. Um, especially, again, especially with the kids home, like there are no days off. Yeah. Um, usually when they go back to school, it gives me more alone time to focus on work. So during the school year, one of the days during the week is like a day where I'm in the woods, not reachable to any society, especially the children. And then the other day of the week is like, I'm home, but I'm not working. And then the rest of the five days then I work. And uh, being in the events industry, you can't keep strict business hours, but I am trying to be better about um, having those times where I'm not accessible to everyone, especially like at the rate that we're growing to. There's also now going to have to be a separation of how accessible I am to certain people. Like there needs to be a buffer. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's let's take Monday, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you have 100 things to do. How do you make sure you focus on like number one and two versus going to number 77? Um, putting things in priority list, depending on what we have coming up, like making sure that I'm focusing on the most uh, important tasks that are relevant to the, the nearest upcoming event or project or deadline. Yeah. All right. Hey, Fancy. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate yeah. it. This is great. <laughs> thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.